Hello. My name is James Parrott. I'm Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. I work on state and local public policies that affect the economy and the budgets that are important to working people in New York City. Um, I want to share some slides with you today. So let me go to my screen and try and get this set up. All right, so hopefully um, you can see uh, these slides. So I want to uh, touch upon three things today. You know, I have about 40 slides here. Um, that's about an hour's presentation, but I only have about 30 minutes. So I'm not going to go, um, I'm not going to talk about each and every slide. Um, I'm going to try and go quickly through the stage setting on this in terms of how income inequality in New York City compares uh, to the nation and some of the factors for that. Um, I want to uh, look um, in detail at the pre-pandemic post Great Recession decade of the 2000s, when there were rising incomes for the bottom half, and in particular, look at the, low, the role that uh, public policy had in uh, accounting for that. And then I want to talk about the new strain of inequality um, that's represented by the pandemic and its very lopsided economic effects in New York City. And my main takeaway is that uh, New York City policy priorities can make a difference. They made a difference in the past uh, decade. We need a new set of public policies at this point to, um, in order to make sure that we don't uh, squander the progress that was made in the, in the previous decade. Um, often um, income inequality uh, is uh, represented by the 1% share of income, the share of all income, that the wealthiest 1% uh, in society have. This is the chart for, um, for the United States overall, basically looking over the past century. This is from the data put together by uh, Piketty and Saez. Um, and it's divided into the three, three periods, three broad periods, um, you know, with a focus on the polarization period since around uh, 1980. This is the New York City version of that for a shorter period of time. We only have income tax data really going back to um, 1980 for New York City and New York State. So at that point, the 1% share of income was, was a little bit higher than the national average. The national average was about 10%, so it was 12% in New York City. But it has risen um, you know, substantially uh, since then, reaching a peak of 45%. Uh, in 2007, uh, right before the 2008-2009 the Great Recession. And what's interesting is that um, in the decade before the pandemic, there was a leveling off uh, to some extent in uh, income concentration in New York City. We recently got the data for, for 2020, and because of a tremendous uh, boom on Wall Street after the the uh, the immediate crisis period in the pandemic, uh, capital gains rose very strongly. Wage incomes were obviously depressed by mass unemployment, uh, with the result being that the 1% um, share of income rose uh, significantly to about 38% in 2020. Um, I'm gonna skip over these slides, which review the sort of the background to broader income inequality trends in New York City. Um, let me, let me pause on this one, uh, this slide, to show you the race and ethnic uh, dimension of uneven incomes in New York City over the past uh, 60 or so years. Um, this uh, shows the census data for the census years and then the American Community Survey data for 2019. Median family income in 2019 dollars uh, by res, race and ethnic uh, uh, breakouts. And you can see um, that the 1960s and the 1980s were period when incomes rose uh, 
to some extent across the board. Um, the 1970s, uh, obviously a period of economic decline and fiscal uh, crisis and ensuing budget austerity with a lot of public sector uh, layoffs in the latter part of the 1970s, tremendous outmigration of white households from New York City during this period. When the um, city, uh, city's economy recovered in the 1980s, strong employment growth, um, the city got to the position where it was able to hire back many of the laid off workers. Many, it, it was able to refill positions that were, um, were reduced in the immediate fiscal crisis period. And because of this substantial migration of the white population, many blacks were able to move into city government positions and um, the black population generally prospered in the 1980s as indicated by the, by the growth in inflation adjusted median family income. That was followed by two decades of, of relative stagnation for uh, families at the median and again, in this period from 1990 to 2010, pretty significant increase in the 1% share of uh, income in New York City. But the median, even the median white family didn't do very well in this period. And uh, families of color didn't do very well with uh, uh, real declines in family incomes over this period. The decade before the pandemic though, um, again saw you know, sort of, uh, you know, across the board, a pretty significant 20% plus increases in real family incomes uh, in New York City. Um, and we're going to spend more time looking at the factors behind that. Um, this bar chart just shows the, the, uh, the data from the previous chart. Uh, you can see that very clearly the income growth in the 60s, the 80s, and the, in the 2010s um, as well. Now, um, if, to focus on the pre-pandemic um, decade, it was a different kind of growth um, uh, with a lot of employment growth in the tech sector, in professional services, and in hospitality. And hospitality is, you know, uh, tourism related jobs, uh, jobs in hotels, but also in, in, in restaurants. Uh, many low wage jobs added over this period. What was distinctive about this period was an historic increase in the state minimum wage for New York City, which more than doubled between the end of 2013 and the end of, of 2018. Um, a pretty significant departure uh, from the past. So even though we got a different character of growth in the, in the 2010s, um, underlying problems uh, of uh, uh, income and wealth polarization uh, remain. It's just that they didn't continue to, that income uh, polarization didn't uh, continue to accelerate as it had for the three decades uh, prior uh, to that. Um, here you can see uh, the sharp rise in the uh, minimum wage, the orange line, relative to the federal minimum wage of 725, which stayed stagnant uh, at this um, uh, over this period. New York City doesn't have the authority under state law to set its own minimum wage. Uh, New York City, on two occasions in 2013 and 2016, raised the minimum wage. Um, uh, in, in New York uh, State in 2016, uh, put New York City on a faster track to get to $15 than in the suburbs and upstate. Of course, it hasn't been, the minimum wage in New York State hasn't been adjusted for inflation since then. So there's been some stagnation and that's one of the policy priorities of a lot of progressive at, at this point is to have a catch up minimum wage increase and then to index it to inflation plus the growth in labor productivity going forward. Um, this chart shows that the tremendous increase in um, uh, uh, real wages 
for the, the bottom five deciles in the wage distribution. 31.7% uh, increase for people in the first decile, 25% increase in the second decile, and so on uh, to 21% for the fifth decile. Pretty unprecedented uh, increases over, you know, a lot of this was concentrated over a subpart of the, the decade of the 2010s, and it's really associated with the period when the minimum wage uh, rose. This had overall imp implications for the share of wage income in New York City. The people in the bottom half uh, increased their share of, of wage income by 1.4 uh, percentage points. Um, whereas uh, at the national level, the bottom half increased their share of uh, wages by only 0.6%. At the other extreme for the top 10%, you can see that their share of wage income in New York City declined by 1.8 percentage point, um, much steeper decline than at the national level where it was only one, one tenth of a percent. Um, this increase in uh, wages at the bottom, uh, of, course, of course, played out uh, for uh, workers of color with um, uh, sharp increases at the second decile and, and median for both, both black and Latinx workers, much greater than for white workers. Whereas white workers at the 80th percentile uh, uh, had uh, a, a much stronger uh, wage increase. Uh, over this period. Uh, a lot of high income um, uh, employees in New York City, overwhelmingly uh, white, uh, they still benefited from a significant wage growth over this period. But this was the first period when we saw really substantial increases in, for people in the bottom half of the distribution. Um, the richest 5% uh, still had over half of all total income uh, more than five times the income uh, received by people in the bottom half. So even though there were strong wage and income gains at, at people for people in the bottom half, we still have a situation uh, characterized by, by pretty uh, pronounced uh, income polarization in New York City. Um, and this translates into a, a, a you know, very uneven, extent of economic hardship. Um, this is one, you know, the, the source here, uh, an analysis of self-sufficiency uh, income budgets by researchers at the University of uh, Washington's uh, Center for Women's Welfare found that as of 2021, 35% of all households in New York City uh, had an income below what was needed to be self-sufficient, that is to provide for basic uh, budget, uh, family budget needs, no frills, no vacations, no savings for college education, um, but also no, it's self-sufficient uh, in the sense that uh, this doesn't factor in any receipt of um, government assistance like food stamps or housing subsidies or childcare subsidies uh, and, and so on. Very uneven across race and ethnic groups. 20% uh, of white families don't have a self-sufficient uh, income level, whereas 44% of Blacks and 50% of Latinx families. Now, it, we, we focus on what I refer to as a new strain of inequality in New York City with the pandemic. Um, the public health disparities, I think people are, are well aware of at this point. This chart shows for New York City neighborhoods, you know, the, 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 the darker color represents a, a greater density of COVID cases in, uh, in, in, in 2020. And that's, um, the pandemic was also characterized by, by widely disparate economic impacts uh, in New York City. Overall, New York City's um, New York City was hit harder in, in the early days of the pandemic, and its recovery from those uh, you know steep job losses has been more gradual than at the national level. Um, as of the middle of 2022, the United States had pretty much recovered uh, to its uh, its pre-pandemic employment level of February of 2020. 
New York City as of November was still two and a half percent or 116,000 jobs short of where it was before the pandemic. And again, this is very highly concentrated in lower paid, what I call face-to-face -face, uh, industries um, where there's a preponderance of uh, less educated uh, and workers of color. Um, I found that in, in, in trying to under, understand and interpret the uh, disparate economic impact of the pandemic, it's been useful to recategorize, recategorize uh, industries into, into three groups, face-to-face, -face, essential, and remote working. And face-to-face -face are all those industries uh, where the jobs can't be done remotely, they have to be done on a face-to-face -face, uh, basis. They're service-oriented uh, jobs like in restaurants, hotels, uh, uh, many uh, brick and mortar retail uh, anyway, arts, uh, transportation, and then industries like construction and manufacturing where you can't work from home. You have to either work on the construction site or in the, in the factory. Essential workers are those healthcare, human services, and public uh, services that continued where, where employment uh, was required for many workers uh, and, and, and those industries continue operating. Remote working, on the other hand, are those industries that can be done by people working from home. These are finance, professional services, tech and information. Um, these, of course, these are all very prominent in industries in, in New York City, very highly paid, uh, with uh, an overrepresentation of, of whites in these positions. These workers did not suffer economically and were given greater flexibility in terms of their working arrangements um, than face-to-face uh, -face, uh, workers who lost jobs in great numbers. This chart uh, shows the very distinctive pattern of job losses in a pandemic relative to what we usually see in an economic downturn where in, in, in the previous, the two most recent economic downturns in New York City, the early 2000s and the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, um, the finance sector and professional services and media get hard hit by job losses. The loss of those high paying jobs then trickles down and you know, it, it takes the form of less consumer spending and less support for what we now call the face-to-face -face service industries. And you see some corresponding but lagged employment decline in those industries. Um, in the pandemic, on the other hand, uh, much uh, smaller employment declines in remote working, steep decline, 37% uh, employment decline in the first two months of the pandemic, February to April of 2020. Um, and, and even as of November, you know, 30 plus months after the onset of the pandemic, uh, still almost a 9% employment decline in face-to-face -face industries, while remote working and essential industries have fully recovered their, uh, em their pandemic employment declines and are and are above uh, pre-pandemic employment uh, levels. Just some observations on this uh, slide about changes in the uh, labor market. Um, dramatically uneven uh, impact, it's hit very hard. At, so in the face-to-face -face service industries, these tend to be the lower paying uh, jobs where there's a greater representation of young workers of less educated workers, workers of color, and immigrants who are non-citizens. Um, and then the reverse on the, you know, in the, in the remote working uh, category. A lot of business turnover as well. We've lost about 300,000 jobs from businesses permanently closing. There's been, uh, and then the, you know, several hundred thousand jobs that haven't come back in existing businesses. On the other hand, other businesses have increased employment, and we have we have seen about two hundred thousand jobs added from businesses that have um, have started up since the pandemic. So a lot of you know a much greater degree of flux in the labor market than uh, what we uh, uh, 
what we usually see. A lot has changed in terms of the attitude of workers, uh, um, employer demands, the mix of industries uh, has changed, use of technology has accelerated, um, tremendous acceleration in, in e-commerce, that's led to a decline in brick and mortar retail employment, but an increase in areas like warehousing, you know, the distribution of packages that people order via uh, e-commerce uh, and, and employment growth in delivery services uh, as, as well. Um, we've seen, you know, I have a slide in a minute on uh, 20 industries that have gained jobs and we break that into three categories uh, of, of analysis. There's been a lot of talk about the great resignation and, it, and it's true that workers' attitudes and demands have changed. People have been reluctant to go back to really low paying jobs where the quality of work was not so great. They may not have offered very benef many benefits or had opportunities for expansion uh, or during the pandemic where like in restaurants, you have to deal with, with uh, customers who uh, can be um, unruly and, and, and difficult to deal with regarding masking requirements and so on. So, so clearly there's been um, difficulty on the part of some industries and employers in attracting workers back. Overall, however, labor force participation has recovered in New York City although it's, it is problematic and challenging to interpret because there has been a significant employment and labor force decline. That's a topic for, for, another, um, for, for, for another day. Um, but if you look at the aggregate data on uh, weekly hours in real average hourly earnings, neither has, have risen, they've declined. And you would expect in a, if the labor market really were tight, and employers were having difficulty hiring people, new people, that they would be extending the hours of existing workers. That hasn't happened. Uh, they would be increasing the uh, inflation adjusted pay offers that they're making. That's happened in a very uneven sense, but the aggregate data don't show any increase across the board. This chart you know, looks at, at all of the detailed industries, the major detailed industries in New York City categorized into these three categories, essential, face-to-face, -face, remote working. You can see uh, for these uh, five industries that are uh, highlighted, all face-to-face -face industries, employment declines 30 plus months after the onset of the pandemic, still in uh, you know, double digit decline territory. And uh, if you add up the absolute decline in those uh, industries, well over the, the net decline of 116,000. And as I said a minute ago, almost a 9% decline for all face-to-face -face industries as a group compared to um, uh, February of 2020. Uh, two thirds of all New York City's working poor people whose family income you know, leave them in poverty but where one or more uh, household members are working, two thirds uh, uh, of the working poor are in face-to-face -face industries, heavily concentrated in restaurants, retail trade, and so on. Young workers, very he heavily concentrated in restaurants, retail, and so on in face-to-face -face industries. Whenever you look at unemployment rates for in your, New York City, it's, it's important to keep in mind the pretty stark disparities by race and ethnic category. So as of the third quarter of 2022, the, un the overall unemployment rate in New York City was 6.1%, but almost 10% for black workers, three and a half percent, almost three times what it is for white workers at 3.5%, and Hispanic workers or Latinx workers more than twice the, uh, the white unemployment rate at 7.5%. Um, now, looking at employment rates, that is the this is also called the the EPOP ratio employment relative to the population in this um, demographic cohort. Um, you can see uh, employment rates have fallen sharply for less educated uh, workers, both males and females, particularly for males with a high school education or less, from 4.2. 
almost 60% to 49%, whereas the employment rates for uh, males with a bachelor's degree or better is up a little bit, and for females is up about two percentage points. Uh, so this, the disparate economic effects are clearly evident by education attainment level. Um, there's also, there are also great disparities by uh, age categories. So young workers, particularly young males, where the employment rate um, dropped from 49% in the six months before the pandemic began to uh, under 38% in the six, you know, basically in the second and third quarter of 2022. Um, whereas for uh, 35 to 44, a slight increase uh, and much smaller declines, 25 to 34, 45 to 54, um, 55 to 64. And, and, and you know, we have seen, uh, uh, you know, the exit of many uh, worker, many older workers, 65. Uh, and older during the pandemic. But um, the sharpest decline in the employment rate here is uh, young males. Um, so in looking at the, these are the 20 industries, uh, sorry, the, the headline here is uh, cut off a little bit. Um, 20 industries that have added net jobs and I, we group these into three categories. Uh, you know, my next slide summarizes the observations about this, but, but just, you know, look, you can see that the industry that's added by far the most jobs, uh, home health care, added over 37,000 jobs. Uh, altogether, these low wage, uh, low and moderate paying jobs in this group A, this first group, uh, account for uh, 98,000 new jobs. That's more than 60% of all net new jobs added over this period. Group B is tech industries and group C is finance and other high paying industries. Um, so the strongest job growth ha has been in this lower uh, paid face-to-face -face or essential industries it includes healthcare. This includes healthcare as opposed to the pandemic categories, um, but it also includes warehouse and temporary help jobs. Um, so New York City is gaining back, you know, we've lost a lot of low-wage jobs. We're gaining back other low-wage jobs, but they're still challenged by, you know, few benefits, fewer opportunities for advancement in many of these fields. Um, it's not uniform across the board. Um, some of the healthcare-related ones do have um, advancement uh, opportunities. Um, you can see there's an increase in outpatient care center, uh, uh, in, in New York City, and there's been some increase in hospital uh, employment as well. The tech industries have, have had about, uh, you know, they grew very rapidly in the prior decade, adding about 200,000 jobs. During the pandemic, they've added 32,000 jobs, 14% job growth. Um, uh, you know, many of these jobs, um, uh, do require uh, a four-year college degree, but there are many uh, non-tech jobs and lower-skilled tech jobs in the in the tech industry uh, as well. So this has a, a broad spectrum of, of employment opportunities. Um, tech industry, of course, has been uh, reducing employment uh, nationally in recent months, and in New York City, Facebook, Twitter and a handful of other tech companies have started uh, layoffs. We expect though, after a few months of, uh, of you know, probably employment leveling off or even declining in the tech sector, um, the sector broadly has you know, very uh, promising long-term employment uh, growth prospects and that should resume after a period of slowdown. Um, high paying jobs, you know, there was one finance related job, uh, portfolio management and other investment activities, which has been increasing. Um, about 40% of all of the jobs in this category of motion picture and TV production. Um, so these generally are industries that have a, you know, higher paying industries that have a competitive edge to being in New York. Um, so they're accounting for some job growth, but only about 15% of the, the total added. 
again, the main takeaway from this is that um, of the industries adding jobs, a lot in low wage uh, uh, areas. Um, it's really important for New York City policymakers to focus on the, the disparities by uh, income, uh, race and class and education that are evident now. What we've seen in the past three prior downturns, economic downturns in New York, when New York City took more or less a laissez-faire approach to the labor market, just sort of let the economy and job market recover on its own, didn't take any special actions to try and accelerate growth or help certain population groups. Um, the, the, these gradual recovery periods were characterized by long periods of very high unemployment for um, workers of color in New York City. So for example, after the early 90s downturn, the recovery took a decade before we got back to the, the uh, early 1990 employment level. And over this decade, unemployment rates for Black and Latinx workers averaged 11 to 12%. Um, similarly, after the uh, early 2000s declined, it took a few years to get back. And after the Great Recession, it took six years to get back to um, uh, 2000 and to, to pre-Great Recession employment levels. And during that time period, uh, black unemployment averaged 13 percent. So the risk is that if New York City doesn't do anything um, in a concerted way to respond to the labor market at this point, that we will, you know, effectively consign workers of color to long, you know, many years of elevated unemployment. Economic hardships clearly are rising in New York City during the pandemic, and particularly since the decline in um, the end of unemployment uh, in insurance uh, in, in New York City. In September of, um, of 2021, federal unemployment benefits ended. You can see the tremendous growth in temporary cash assistance recipiency. It's now, it's now up 35% over where it was before the pandemic. This takes us back to, you know, basically uh, early 2004 level for public assistance recipients. Uh, also a pretty substantial increase in uh, SNAP benefits or food stamps. Uh, that's up 15% over the pandemic and 25% more New Yorkers are receiving Medicaid. We had a high Medicaid recipiency rate before the pandemic and yet it's increased by 25%. Um, this chart shows that the, the uh, real wage changes for three periods in time. One, the pre-pandemic period, 2013 to 19. The, uh, the uh, orangey uh, bars there in the middle, the first two years the, of the pandemic through 2021, and then the blue bars are basically the most recent year through the first three quarters of 2022 compared to the first three quarters of 2021. So what's striking here is that the wage growth for uh, the 20th percentile uh, males and females was in this pre-pandemic uh, period. Um, some wage gains in the first two years of the pandemic, but in the past year, when, when inflation has been at its highest level in 40 years, stagnation or decline across the board, except for males at the 90th percentile, who had, believe it or not, a 29% increase in inflation adjusted wages on top of a 40% increase in the first two years of the pandemic. This is my last slide and I'll conclude on this note that local policies can make a difference as we saw with the increase in the minimum wage in the pre-pandemic uh, decade. We now need an act, what I would say, uh, we need an active labor market policy to reconnect workers and to provide skills needed for workers to trade up to better jobs. We need to raise wages again. We need to have a catch up for the period since 2019 when there's been no increase. And then we need to index the minimum wage going forward 
not only to the consumer price index, but also to, to labor productivity. Um, there's a proposal in Albany this year to raise the, the minimum wage to $21.25 and by early 2026 and, in, and adjust it for an inflation and productivity growth after that. We also need to raise pay for uh, many workers in the care jobs category, home care workers, child care workers. We need to ex further expand the, the affordability and accessibility of child care. We need um, better labor protections to curb the misclassification of workers and to further expand gig worker protections. New York City has led the way nationally in uh, establishing minimum pay uh, standard for for hire vehicle drivers, that is Uber and Lyft drivers. And they're on the verge of instituting a minimum pay standard for restaurant delivery workers. Those two policies combined will benefit about 180,000 workers. Um, and we also, property tax reform is clearly a topic for another, uh, another discussion. We have a very inequitable property tax system um, by race and income category. Uh, there's a proposal on the table to fix that. We need action on that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, I invite your questions via uh, email. Um, and I have some, um, uh, you know, our website is uh, centernyc.org uh, and you can find uh, many of our publications on that. Thank you.